Oh, ahoy! I'm just digging underneath my apartment because some guy called me and told me there's some treasure buried beneath here. It was so nice of him to just call and give me such information, and all I had to do was give him my social security. What a steal! Looks like we got something. Oh, hell yeah. So picture this, it's 1993 and you are Midway. That arcade machine that you released in 1991 that got brought to consoles a year later is making a lot of money. And you want to make some more money so you hire the guys that made the thing that makes money to develop a sequel and make even more money. Simple. And that is how we ended up with Mortal Kombat 2. Ed Boon and John Tobias were ecstatic about turning Mortal Kombat into a franchise. And for the second installment in the series they wanted to take everything about the original game and expand on it. More characters, more stages, more story, more secrets, and more importantly, more blood and more fatalities. Mortal Kombat 2 was released to arcades in 1993 and was a gargantuan hit. And also following in the footsteps of its predecessor, eventually made its way to home consoles the very next year in 1994. All the consoles that got MK1 got MK2. Though Europe did get a Master System version. That's interesting, I guess. Now, with every 90s ultra-violent arcade game making its transition towards consoles, comes a great commercial. The MK2 commercial features the actors that portrayed the fighters with rapid cuts from them fighting, standing, and random shots of lizards. Don't forget about the lizards. Now this is a great commercial. It also has a very 90s feel to it, and while it doesn't leave you with the same impression that the first Mortal Kombat commercial did, it still did a great job at making Mortal Tuesday just as hype as Mortal Monday. Once again, we are checking out the Super Nintendo version because... This is the Mortal Kombat of my SNES years. I remember loving and playing this game so much and I'm super eager to play it again after all these years. But before jumping in, there is just one more interesting thing to point out. So we remember Mortal Kombat 1 and all its controversy and hoopla that it caused with the blood and gore. So Mortal Kombat was like, okay, I'll do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So all the negative press was something Nintendo kinda got nervous about, so when they brought MK1 over they heavily censored it, which led to very poor sales for that version. So, Nintendo, despite having the arguably more faithful version gameplay and graphics wise to the arcade game, saw that Sega had the more popular version simply because it had the red stuff. Proving that money is a hell of a motivator to changing someone's stance on things, Nintendo turned to the dark side and allowed the blood and gore onto their platform. Though on the SNES box they did include this tag to inform people of the not so family friendly content that resides inside the box. This is just something interesting to see because the ESRB was finally formed in September of 1994 a week after Mortal Kombat 2 came out. And if you look at the Game Boy version that came out in October, you'll see that M smack dab on the box. This is something I'm speculating about, but the fact that there was no ESRB and Nintendo was kind of nervous about having this game and all its violence on their platform, especially after seeing what happened to Sega, it's kind of cute seeing that they try to find a way to cover their tracks just in case of anything. All right, enough dilly-dallying. It's time to finally play Mortal Kombat 2 and boy, I hope it's as good as I remember. What a weird looking menu. We're off to a bad start. So, starting up, we only have two options, start and options, which is fine. Two menu options are the Mortal Kombat staples, so so far so good. But this menu just looks weird to me, man. This bottom section being transparent throws me off and makes it look sloppily thrown together. <laughs> yeah. So the story of Mortal Kombat 2 is as follows. After Liu Kang defeated Shang Tsung in the tournament from the previous game, the sorcerer returns to his emperor Shao Kahn, an Outworld who is ready to kill him, but Shang Tsung convinces him to instead host a winner-take-all Mortal Kombat tournament in Outworld. Shao Kahn likes the idea, and to learn the Earthrealm fighters, he sends his forces to attack Liu Kang's Shaolin Temple and massacre the monks while also kidnapping Sonya Blade and Kano. This plan ends up working as Raiden decides to gather the Earthrealm warriors to go to Outworld and compete in the tournament. The story is once again given to us piece by piece with these stills that pop up on the menu. But again, there are comic books made by John Tobias that help further explain and expand the story of Mortal Kombat that a nerd would own, but his bank for some reason isn't responding. Let's look at the roster. We have a total of 12 characters to choose from, which is a pretty nice amount. 5 out of the 7 playable characters reappear from the first game. Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Johnny Cage, Liu Kang, and Raiden with a Y all return. Two characters that weren't playable from MK1 debut as playable characters in this game with the Secret Fire Reptile and Final Boss Shang Tsung joining the roster. And even though Kano and Sonya Blade aren't playable, they do still appear in the background of the Colosseum stage. So that's something. 
Now, moving on to the five new fighters, Jax is our military representation, replacing Sonya. He is a special forces officer that was saved by Sonya in the last game from Shang Tsung and now is repaying the favor. Kung Lao, a fellow Shaolin monk and ally of Liu Kang, seeking revenge for the attack on his temple. Baraka, a Tarkatan creature of our world who led the attack on the Shaolin temple. Kitana, a female ninja who is the daughter of Shao Kahn that allies herself with Liu Kang and Earthrealm. And Melina, the clone of Kitana infused with Tarkatan blood that would go on to leave all the boys that play these games confused about themselves. Now, if we want to be technical, Sub-Zero is sorta of a new character. In canon, the Sub-Zero from the first game was killed by Scorpion and his younger brother assumed his role and became the new Sub-Zero. It's worth mentioning because it continues the rivalry between Sub-Zero and Scorpion. In the first game, Scorpion is after Sub-Zero to avenge himself, but in this game, Sub-Zero is after Scorpion to avenge his brother's death. Overall, the roster here is really great. Mortal Kombat 2 has 12 characters that are all incredibly distinct from one another, which is quite a feat considering that two of these characters are twins. So after selecting our character, we see the layout of the tournament with Shao Kahn atop of the mountain with us starting our climb at the very bottom. Like in the previous game, we must first go through all the fighters in the game before we get to the bullshit. Now, visually Mortal Kombat 2 looks great. The character models don't look as blurry as they did in the first game and actually have a crisper look to them. Everything just pops out, making for an overall pleasant visual experience. The game has 9 stages we fight in and they are leagues better. Don't get me wrong, the stages from the first Mortal Kombat all look good, but my statement is less about the graphics and more about the interesting places that we find ourselves fighting in. The game taking place in Outworld left the door open for very creative and varied environments. The trees with the creepy faces, the acid pool, the portal, the hallway with the spikes and ceiling that for some stupid dumb f reason a young me was always cautious when jumping trying to avoid it. All of these stages are phenomenal. No stages from the previous game make a proper return, but the pit did get a sequel with some more stuff going on in the background that people would speculate about for years to come. That was something I never got behind. People saw this guy on fire in the background and went on and on and on about how that's Blaze from Armageddon. I was never part of that mindset because it could just be a guy on fire. Newsflash, not everybody who's on fire is automatically Blaze. The core of the gameplay is all the same. We got a 2D fighter that's the best of 3 rounds where we gotta completely deplete our opponent's health bar. Mortal Kombat 2 is much faster paced than the previous game, so much so that it can give you whiplash, brace yourself. The game overall has a really nice crunchy feel to it like when you bite a nice crispy piece of bacon. The way the screen shakes combines with the slightly overblown and distorted sound effects all combine really nicely to make this a pretty satisfying fighter that makes you feel the hits. Plus when you perform a fatality the way the game writes it on screen with the blood dripping is oddly satisfying. Speaking of, in Mortal Kombat 2 each character got 2 fatalities and a few even got 3. For this conversion of the arcade game, Nintendo brought its red marker to work and we have all the blood splatter going on and more importantly, we have the fatalities. And some of these fatalities are brutal. They take huge leaps in its gore compared to the previous title. In the last game, Kano pulls out your heart but it's just a red pixel and the sound effect is what sells it. In this game, Jesus Christ, look at that! The game does have plenty of brutal fatalities but there are also some a bit on the silly side like how Melina will suck you up <gasps> and then just regurgitate a bunch of bones. Oh. Or how Johnny Cage punches your head off not once, not twice, but three times. There are a few misses here. Liu Kang kept the cartwheel uppercut, but this time the screen goes dark at least. Also, Jax just rips off your arms, which sure seems brutal, but it doesn't look like it kills the opponent considering he just continues to stand there. Gosh, I must sound like a fucking lunatic. Um, I'm being too pessimistic here. Rather than focusing on the few misses that you can only really count them on one hand, Let's focus on the glorious fatalities that this game does bring. Like how Reptile pulls off his mask to show his reptile-ness and eats your goddamn head. Melina gives us an old prison shankin, Jack straight up claps our head gone, and while Liu Kang has the lamest fatality in the game, his other does feature him turning into a fucking dragon and munching on the opponent, so that makes up for it. Oh, and we also have plenty of beheadings to satisfy French revolutionists. Mortal Kombat 2 is also where Mortal Kombat begins to show more of its fun side, which seems pretty twisted to say. Oh, Men will introduce new types of finishers to perform at the end of each match, those being babalities and friendships. Babalities simply just turn your opponent into a baby. Now, I never cared for these because it just turns them into an emotionless sprite. At least in MK9, the babality showed them doing something funny like Sub Zero pissing himself, but the piss freezes over and he slips, and oh, that stupid baby. Here though, it's not too exciting, but that's because I'm looking at it in the wrong context. Just picture the scene in 1993, imagine two dudes playing Mortal Kombat 2, one of them loses because of some bullshit because it's Mortal Kombat, it's gonna be bullshit. And he starts rage quitting and getting all pissy and the cheeky bastard they were playing performs a babality, it must have been gold. Babalities are probably hysterical in multiplayer, but not too interesting in single player. 
friendships have your character do something silly like Liu Kang dancing, Baraka giving you a present, Johnny Cage giving you an autograph, and the ninja characters all engaging in capitalism. All of these were introduced to kind of poke fun at parents and politicians who constantly dogged on the game for its violence. What do you mean this game is grotesque? It's Kid Thunder, damn it! Stage fatalities are also more present here, with the game now having three of these. You can dump your opponent in acid, send them to the bottom of the pit where a funny looking cutscene plays, or uppercut them into the spikes on the ceiling. I knew it! This time though, to perform these, we do need to perform a proper button combo to do them, which sure is how the series is today, but I don't know, it's nice to be able to just do an uppercut. Now diving into gameplay, the two biggest issues I had with the previous title was the controls and the difficulty. Let's start with the controls. Now once again, to succeed in Mortal Kombat is knowing the special moves and how to execute them. And with all the new characters and an overall increased moveset leads to many more button combos to try to memorize. Shang Tsung's moveset is especially nuts. Not only does he have three separate attacks of numerous fireballs to launch, but he can also transform into any of the playable characters and use their moves, but to do that, each character transformation has their own button combo, and that's just insane! I'm running out of room to write all this stuff. In the last game, I talked about how the controls felt stiff and it made things more difficult than it had to be when it came to trying to perform attacks or special moves. So, what's the situation here? Now, Mortal Kombat 2 controls very well, but you see, we do still have that stiff problem here where sometimes it feels like the input I put into my control decides to stumble its way up the wire while fighting off bees. And, well, let's hope it gets there in one piece. It's made even more apparent here because of the game's overall increase in speed, so you're trying to really quickly knock these moves out, but nothing happens and you end up just standing there while the computer approaches you and takes advantage. I will say the first couple times playing Mortal Kombat 2 definitely felt a bit frustrating, especially with how difficult he is, and oh, we'll get to that. Now, I gotta say, a lot of these Mortal Kombat 2 special moves and finishers are not easy to perform at all. For starters, some attacks like Liu Kang's bicycle kick don't need a button combo, but instead require you to hold the button and release after 3 seconds. Which is asking a lot considering that I'd be lucky to even have such time given to me. And you know what bothers me? Why does the computer get to start the match with a bicycle kick? Where was the 3 seconds? What's even more wild is certain finishers also require this hold the button concept. Like both of Rain's fatalities require you to just hold the button for 6 and 8 seconds, which sounds easy, but there's not even 8 seconds in the finish him screen. Shang Tsung's third fatality is even more wild because that requires 25 seconds with the internet telling me that I need to start in the final round. Like, what, how does, what does that mean? Does it mean I have to fight while holding down the button and make sure I win the round perfectly within 25 seconds? Now let's take the Jax Fatality where we must be real close, hold low punch while performing D-pad motions, but if I press the low punch button while close, it will hit the opponent and not let me perform the finish in the first place. Sub-Zero's first fatality requires two separate button combos. The first to freeze your opponent, but this isn't the same freeze attack you use in the game, no, this is a whole new separate button combo, and then you need to perform a separate combo to do the actual killing blow. This is just asking for way too much, man. Overall, performing all the finishes and special moves, no matter how simple they look, is actually pretty difficult here in Mortal Kombat 2, which makes things worse when we discuss the difficulty. So in Mortal Kombat 1, the difficulty rose sharply through each match, one, but as you lose, it slowly decreases. The first two fights in Mortal Kombat 1 are against ragdolls, and it's during the third fight it really becomes a challenge. In Mortal Kombat 2, the first match actually has some bite to it, and I actually really like that. As you work your way up the tournament, the difficulty rises actually a smooth way up. You'll notice the computer is harder, but it's not going to straight up smack you in the face. But you see, once you get to the 9th or 10th fight, holy shit, what's happening? It's from this point the computer starts getting extremely grab happy, and those special moves that you're going to work so hard to pull off are going to be blocked or dodged 90% of the fucking time. Did I mention you have limited continues too? Oh yeah, in the last game you had unlimited retries, but in this game you only have 5, and once you lose 5 times, that's it. Game over. There are no endurance matches here, thank f***ing god. Now what makes the difficulty in this game better than the last game is that in the first Mortal Kombat, the computer, and I'm saying this without radiating a single ounce of shame from my body, cheats. It spams attacks and cheeses you. Here, the CPU actually fights with honor and didn't just do the same thing over and over again. It was definitely a less irritating way to lose. And hey, this game actually fixed an issue I had in the last game. In this game, dual projectiles will hit both opponents. Thanks, Midway. So after defeating the 11th fighter, we go up against Shang Tsung, and yes, this is more of the same fight in the last game, but no bullshit girl transformations. Shang Tsung is very difficult to beat, but once you do, it's onto the game's sub-boss, Kintaro, a product of Goro, f***ing a tiger. Kintaro is an underrated boss character in the series, and I don't get why, because this dude is scary and completely awful to fight. It is more of the same thing from the last game, who deals so much damage it's unfair, takes so little damage it's bullshit, and ruthlessly charges you and it's goddamn terrifying. What gets you through Goro is spamming projectiles and keeping your distance. 
See, fighting Goro was hard, but it seemed like you can put up a fight at least. Here, I'm f***ing crying, I can't do anything! Kintaro blocks all your attacks, and keeping your distance isn't an option because he can close the gap real quick, launch his own projectiles quickly and rapidly, and the whole thing where he jumps up and lands on you for about 5 minutes. Just beating Kintaro in one round is an impossible task, and the game expects me to beat him in two? And goddamn, apparently the battle used to be even more difficult in the arcades before Midway upgraded the game to not be so hard. <sighs> How the f*** did anyone do this? I absolutely believe Midway went a bit overboard with this game's difficulty. And sure, it does mean that when you finally beat the bosses, it feels f***ing amazing, but with the amount of pain and hurt that'll come beforehand, especially that we have limited continues that's gonna make things even more difficult, makes it not worth it. I really started to wonder how the hell was I able to beat this guy when I was a kid, and then I remembered. Oh yeah, I cheated. Yeah, I'm a bitch. Mortal Kombat 2 has cheats that you can activate by being on the character select screen and rapidly entering a sequence of the D-pad before pressing the select button, and once you hear a gong, it means you did it. These cheats include things like giving yourself 30 continues, skipping to Kentaro or Shao Kahn, extending the fatality time, and giving you super strength and durability. Now, it is something that Sun Tzu once said that cheating to win doesn't feel as satisfying. And sure, relentlessly beating on Kentaro didn't give me that satisfaction of actually winning the match, but it did at the very least feel a bit therapeutic. But yeah, to the everyday schlub like me, using the 30 continue cheat was essential because some of these fights really are ridiculous. Now when you're climbing the ranks, at some point you'll notice this question mark that we just skip over. Well, that's the secret characters for you. So the secret reptile fight from the first Mortal Kombat was a huge hit in arcades, so Mortal Kombat 2 wanted to do more of that and now brought us three secret characters to try to find and unlock. These were Jade, Smoke, and Noob Saibot. Now once in a while before a fight in MK1, Reptile would jump out and drop hints on how to find them. And even without an internet search, after a couple of tournament playthroughs you should have gathered enough clues to have an idea of what to do to find them. Here though, I've only seen it happen once in 12 tournament playthroughs, meaning you absolutely need to look it up to find them. Now, on the forest stage you will sometimes see them pop their heads out, but this is more of a fun tease rather than actually helping you. Once you figure out how to find them, the screen will flash at you to get ready and then prepares you to face an undiscovered warrior from NK1 and sends you back to Goro's lair. Which, honestly, did feel pretty cool. Like the reptile fight, these secret fights are very difficult. These guys move super fast. Each of the secret characters has their own criteria to fulfill on how to find them. The green female ninja Jade is the easiest of the three. All you have to do is in the fight that takes place right before the question mark is to win a single round by only using low kicks. The male Grey Ninja Smoke is on paper easy to find. All you have to do is be on the portal stage and at the moment the Toasty pops up, you must press down and start on the controller to initiate the fight. See, it's easier said than done because I'd go whole matches uppercutting opponents on the stage and it seems like Dan took a vacation or something because it doesn't pop up! The last secret fighter is the Black Ninja Noob Saibot, another one of Mortal Kombat's coolest characters made in the simplest way. Take the Sub-Zero model and completely turn up the darkness and when it came to naming him, the two head honchos took their last names and went, is it worth it? Can I work it? I'll put my thing down, flip it and reverse it. To unlock Noob, you had to win 50 straight matches. Definitely a difficult task that I heard stories online of how people would plug in a second controller and spend hours beating on the dummy until they hit that jaded number. But damn it, I don't have time for that these days, so thank god there are also cheats you can use to get to the secret fighters. Thank god I wrote all these down. At the same time though, fighting the secret fighters in this game didn't feel as special as it was fighting Reptile. And it's not because I cheated. I organically unlocked the Jade fight and it was a lot easier than I thought and I did it on my first attempt. And Smoke is pretty RNG based. Sure, Noob isn't easy to unlock, but the fact that it's grinding for hours just to get decimated by him in a minute makes putting in that effort undesirable. Reptile felt like something you unlocked, all the mounted criteria made finding him feel like an accomplishment. You don't unlock the characters by beating them, which I expected at this point. You don't get the 10 million points, which I'll be honest, doesn't matter here. Regardless of win or lose, you'll get booted back to the tournament. So we finally arrive at the top of the mountain after getting through the bullshit, the bullshit, and the bullshit. We arrive at the final battle against the Emperor of Outworld, Shao Kahn, who starts off the match by taunting you before he unleashes the hurt upon you. Shao Kahn is the ultimate baddie of the Mortal Kombat franchise, and he makes his debut here in the sequel like he's Jason Voorhees. Everything we know about Shao Kahn battles is here from the very beginning with the powerful quick attacks, insane durability, and the persistent taunting throughout. Yes, not only does he beat us mercilessly, but he also demoralizes us. Is that your best? Imagine being a kid coming home from getting bullied at school and trying to do the one thing that makes you happy only to have to deal with even more physical and verbal abuse. 
That must have sucked. Shao Kahn was a huge upgrade over Shang Tsung in the previous game. In the last game, the final boss was slightly underwhelming since he just turned into other characters. Here Shao Kahn is his own man and he is completely terrifying. He isn't as difficult as Kentaro, though I am making that assessment based on the fact that I was able to beat Shao Kahn without cheating. I was spamming, but I wasn't cheating. After beating Shao Kahn, he starts weirdly saying no. No, no, no. Before teleporting across all the different stages using what I'm sure is the DK Country Barrel Blast launch sound effect. And then we pop up back at the Coliseum where he turns to stone and shatters. Sadly, not as cool as the arcade version was. The screen tells us that Shao Kahn's rule is over and that we once again are the Supreme Mortal Kombat Champion. The game goes on to show us our character's ending, showing us what would they do with their tournament win with the tiniest accompanying picture possible. Again, a bunch of non-canon endings for each character. Johnny Cage makes a sequel Mortal Kombat movie that's so successful ha! that a third Mortal Kombat is inevitable. Well now that's just funny. All these endings seem right by the characters and even Raiden this time who is now the protected that we'd all know him to be and not using his ending to destroy the earth before wishing us a nice day. That'd be Shang Tsung. We are then shown the cast of characters, which is always something that I love games do, before being shown the credits and we're back at the menu where now we can just play the game all over again. Now, there was one more super secret within this game. Legend says if you beat a human opponent 250 times in a row, you unlock a single game of Pong. Yep, a single game of fucking Pong that uses Mortal Kombat sound effects. I hope your whole day was worth that. Multiplayer. Same thing. And that is Mortal Kombat 2. Was it as good as I remember? Yeah, but it didn't feel that way at first. The issue of the difficulty in the controls definitely made me feel a bit disappointed at first. But after a while, I felt like I was catching up to speed and found myself enjoying it again like I used to before. And I started playing better. Can you believe it? I played a game enough and I got good at it. Who knew? And I actually managed to beat Kentaro in a single round. I didn't win the match, but we're making progress. With Mortal Kombat 2, Tobias and Boon wanted to expand the greatness of the first Mortal Kombat, and they sure did. The game took leaps in its gameplay, graphics, characters, story, blood, and gore. Mortal Kombat 2 is also where the series really formed its identity. Yes, Mortal Kombat is all about the violence and pissing off parents, but it's also about having fun and not taking things too seriously. Being a game that's over the top and does silly things like friendships, fatalities, and the whole toasty thing is also just as much Mortal Kombat as fatalities are. Performance wise, this game absolutely killed it, pun intended. Mortal Kombat 2 was an enormous commercial success, establishing Mortal Kombat as an ultra successful fighting franchise, which definitely made Midway happy. Like the previous title, this has been considered one of the greatest video games of all time, and some even say that it even topped the original. And I'd agree. Mortal Kombat 2 was considered the peak of the Mortal Kombat games for about 17 years until Mortal Kombat 9 came out, with people even to this day arguing that this is the best in the series. Personally, I wouldn't say it's the best, but it's definitely top 3. Mortal Kombat 2 is great, and if you were going to revisit one of the three games from the original SNES years, I do heavily recommend it being Mortal Kombat 2. And Mortal Kombat 1 is not a bad option either. Mortal Kombat 3? We'll get to. Ah, I do wish I was able to read the comic books though. I want to read a more in-depth explanation of what the story of this game is. Oh, we're getting a call. Hello? Hi, we heard you're looking for Mortal Kombat 2 comic books. Boy, am I. Great, we happen to have some extra that we're willing to give you in exchange for one of your kidneys. <laughs> what a day for deals. 